Hi, my name is Celeste Stewart, and today I'm going to be sharing with you a bit of the project I've been working on about spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, or SCA1. For the past 20 years, researchers have been trying to identify the normal function of the protein that causes SCA1 with hopes of developing a therapeutic. Some evidence has come to light, though, just in the past year, which suggests they've been looking in the wrong direction. I've been very lucky to have been part in the shift in the SCA1 field, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the data I've gathered in support for this new research direction for SCA1. SCA1 is an inherited neurodegenerative disease with prevalence of about 1 in 100,000. It's the result of the death of Purkin T cells within the cerebellum, shown here in green, which leads to the progressive atrophy of this area of the brain. This causes the hallmark symptom of SCA1, ataxia, or the loss of motor control and balance. Symptoms usually develop in a person's 30s or 40s, after which life expectancy is typically 10 to 15 years. Now, this all starts with an error in the ataxin 1 protein. In the wild type, or normal protein, there's a polyglutamine track, which is represented here in orange. It's a series of repeating glutamine amino acids, which is usually 6 to 42 repeats long. However, when there are more repeats and this polyglutamine track expands, people start developing SCA1. The longer the polyglutamine track, the earlier symptoms develop. Now, this is a very well-documented correlation. However, it can only account for about 64% of the variance we see at aged onset of SCA1 symptoms. Researchers wanted to know what it accounted for the remaining variants, as this could shed some light onto the normal function of a taxon 1. So last May, Bettencourt and colleagues published an SMP analysis of SCAs and other related diseases. In this type of study, they are asking if small genetic variations can modify or impact the progression of a disease. In this case, if it affects the age at which SCA1 symptoms first occur. And this can give us some insight into what systems are being affected by SCA1. And what they found was a significant association between DNA damage repair genes and the age at onset of SCA1. This was kind of a shock to the field, as, as no one had ever examined a taxon 1 in the context of DNA damage before. So this caused us to wonder, if DNA damage repair genes can significantly modify age of onset in SCA1, could this mean that a taxon 1 is somehow involved in DNA damage repair? To test this hypothesis, I used variations of the DNA damage stripe assay, where a region of interest is manually defined and then irradiated with a 405 nanometer laser, inducing DNA damage to this specific area of the nucleus. This experimental setup focuses on the recruitment of protein to the stripe, as opposed to the recovery of what was previously there. Using this method, in addition to immunofluorescence, I was the first person to show that endogenous ataxin 1 localizes to DNA damage. The white box indicates the irradiated area of the nucleus. In the same experiment, a taxon 1 was shown to co-localize with a protein that has already been demonstrated to localize to DNA damage. Next, I wanted to examine how different modifications to the ataxin 1 protein would affect its localization to DNA damage repair, I, uh, to DNA damage. I examined four different forms of ataxin 1. So wild type, in order to get a baseline, expanded ataxin 1 with 84 repeats to examine the mutant protein, and then the last two constructs I examined had the exact same polyglutamine track lengths as the previous two mentioned, but they also had a serine 776 to alanine mutation. I wanted to examine this specific mutation, as it has been shown to reduce symptoms within SCA1 mouse models, and I wanted to see how this would translate to a protein level. So to examine these modifications, I used EGFP tag transfected ataxin 1, which looks a bit different as it forms these nuclear inclusions as a side effect of the transfection process. Again, the white boxes indicate the irradiated areas, and they will fade when the videos begin playing. So these nuclear inclusions, and both of these, they seem pretty similar to the naked eye. The nuclear inclusions near the stripe area localize towards DNA damage. However, there is a striking visual difference when compared with S776A ataxin 1 mutant constructs of the same polyglutamine track length. These nuclear inclusions are much smaller, and their movements appear more random less ataxin 1 seems to be localizing to the stripe. Now, I was able to quantify how much ataxin 1 localizes by measuring the average pixel intensity of the regions of interest over time in the green channel images. So in this process, a ROI is drawn into the cell and then irradiated. And since the nuclear inclusions are bright, while well, the remainder of the nucleus is relatively dark, as the nuclear inclusions enter the region of interest, the average pixel intensity for the region of interest increases. These values are then normalized to control cells, which are prepared using the exact same method and have a region of interest defined and measured, but they are not irradiated. 
This is to account for random nuclear inclusion movement, which may inadvertently increase the pixel intensity of the region of interest. Thus, an increase in intensity indicates that a taxon 1 is localizing to the stripe, and thus to DNA damage. So five minutes post irradiation, and we can already see a clear difference between the ataxin 1 constructs. Wild type ataxin 1 localized to DNA damage the best, followed by expanded ataxin 1, which had more difficulty reaching the stripe. The S776A mutants had much lower intensity values, indicating that this mutation had a severe impact on ataxin 1's ability to localize to DNA damage. So what does this all mean? Well, this data supports that ataxin 1 is involved in the DNA damage repair process. To what extent is not yet known and will require further examination. Although this data does lay some groundwork for future research onto ataxin one's involvement in DNA damage repair. But there's still a lot we don't know, and the few answers I have found over these past few months have only led to more questions. But as mentioned, it lays some groundwork for future research into this topic and this new direction for SCAL1. So if you have any more questions about SCAL1 or would like to know where the research has gone from here, I'd be happy to talk with you in the break today. Thank you.